really? Oh my heavens. Gosh. As far back as I can remember, it's hung on the wall of each one of the homes that I've lived in. Can you adore it? Oh, I love it, yes. Just the vibrancy of the colour, and I'm a very much an outdoor person, so when I, it's the type of homestead I'd love to live in so myself. It, so it belonged to your parents, did it? It belonged to my parents, yes. My father was an artist, a Yorkshire man, quite an avid traveller with his paint box, and I was given to understand that he actually met Fred Hall. And, you know, Fred Hall died in 1948, I think. So. Oh, well, then he was well so within my father's absolutely. lifetime. So yes. your father probably painted with him, maybe. Maybe. That mm. I can't qualify. Because this is really, you know, the, 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 the thing about a picture like this is it's a real artist painting. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a painting that, as you say, breathes light colour and, and, and it's somebody who's really thought about it. Because mm -hmm. the interesting thing about Fred Hall is that as a young man in Newlyn, he was a bit sort of heavy-handed and pedantic. Yes. But he was a great experimenter with paint. Oh. He loved to push paint around to see what it would do for him. Right. And so, unlike a lot of artists who flower in youth and get pedantic and boring later on, yes. Fred Hall was the opposite. He was always pushing paint around and he got better and better. Yes. And so this is a later painting by him. But it's full of the joy of painting. Isn't yes, it? you'd call it springtime, wouldn't you? The freshness in the greens are the spring greens, aren't yes. they? Yes, and I love the way he's captured the sunlight on the hedge and this side and the, and the roof and the wall. I suppose it's in the spirit of the, of the times. I think people like space and air yes. today. Mm -hmm. Not the claustrophobia of Victorian England. No, they no. like exactly the opposite. And, and so this sort of painting is very much in our spirit today. Yes. And, uh, and so, because it's a popular painting, I think it would do very well today. Really? Well, I, I would say probably around sort of eight to 12,000 pounds. Really? Oh, my. <laughs> Has this picture been in your family for a long time? Uh, yes, it has, over 100 years. It um, came down to my brother from a maternal grandfather, and we think it's one that he bought in Holland. Um, an old man in Holland was bedridden. And he had a lovely collection of pictures, which, and he had a new picture put at the end of his bed every day to look at. But when he became very old, he decided to sell the collection. And my grandfather and another friend went over and bought up the entire collection and divided it between them. And we think this is probably one of those, because Dutch pictures at the time were out of fashion, and he got them very reasonably. And so um, we think all the Dutch pictures came from him. Really? Well, it is a lovely picture. And um, as we can see here from the label, Hermann Swanefeld, uh, it is indeed by him. Labels yes. can very often be misleading, yeah. but in this case, this picture is absolutely genuine. Um, this can be backed up by this charming little monogram here, which is quite difficult to see, but uh, which is H and then an intertwining V and S, which is typical for uh, Swanefeld. But besides that, it is very typical of the artist's work. Mm -hmm. He was, I don't know whether you know, but he was a Dutch painter of the 17th century, born around 1600. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a pupil of Claude Lorraine. And like a lot of Dutch painters of that era, the Golden Age, um, he came to Rome and painted mm -hmm. there. A lot of painters from Holland did exactly the same thing. And they were all, a lot of them were very influenced by Claude Lorraine, who was an immensely influential landscape painter. Yeah. And as a result, a lot of these Dutch paintings have a very Italian look about them. Regarding the quality of the picture, I think it's uh, variable, but on the whole, very nice. I think this figure here is particularly, particularly well painted, yeah. uh, whereas perhaps uh, other uh, areas of the painting are not quite so good. So perhaps some of the cattle here are a little bit weak and the rendering of the water is perhaps not quite as good as it might be. Um, well, I think a picture in this sort of uh, this sort of condition, which is rather dirty and has obviously been in a private collection for a long time, could well be worth in excess of £15,000 today. Yeah, yeah. And possibly more. The rip has always been there. Is it? Well, where's it been then, this much-loved picture? Uh, I think it was in an old barn or a farm building for about 30 years. And then my father, he bought it about 20 years ago. I think it was a house sale yeah. for a few pounds. It wasn't expensive. Yeah. What did he think about it? Um, he liked it, but we didn't know how to get it restored. Right. So it just got left. I've always assumed it was uh, Waterhouse. 
Do you know about Waterhouse? Mm, I've seen an antiques road show before and there was a painting on there by the yeah. same artist and that's why I bought this today. Right, but this is so untypical, this yeah. picture, that first of all we say, well, it's not really a Waterhouse. But it is signed JWW down here. And if I think about Waterhouse when he started painting, he was sort of experimenting. He wasn't really very well trained when he started painting. He painted little interiors and this sort of thing. And I personally think this is by Waterhouse, John William Waterhouse, because I think it's the young man coming into being a better painter and before he's really decided the subjects he really wants to do, which is his affinity to the pure athletes and pretty girls. So, on balance, I'm going to say this is a genuine Waterhouse. And then we have to say, well, since you've looked after it so beautifully... No. <laughs> I'm not to blame for it. <laughs> since you looked after it so beautifully, what's it worth? It's in rotten condition, but this can be put right, although I think that that will be difficult to clean. Yeah. This I'm not worried about, but the, the dirt is quite ingrained into that impasto there, I think between five and 10,000 pounds, <laughs> five or 6,000 pounds. Shock, I am shocked, I am. I thought about 500 pounds. I'm so worried about the rip. Well, it's pretty nasty. That is horrid, you know, and that oh, needs yeah. a lot of work doing, and so does this. But I don't see why, you know, finished and all done up, somebody might ask 20,000 pounds for something. So it, it's worth for me to take it and have it restored? I think so, yes. Do you have any background information about this picture? Well, all I know is a letter so Mrs. K, way back in 1900, claimed that one of the ladies was her great-grandmother. And then, about 1920s, a Mr. K wrote from Calcutta, wanted to know what had happened to Mrs. K, because he thought she had the original dra draft of this picture. And, but after that, it seems to have died the history. Yes. Um, and so, therefore, we think it's of the K sisters, do we? Uh, well, what, yes, one was Mrs. Her, her great grandma, and the other was a Mrs. Robin had become a Mrs. Robinson. Yes. And was there any indication at all of, of an artist at all? Any? Well, uh, apparently at the time it was claimed to be a Romney, but in this correspondence that was denied, and it was said to be Mrs. K claimed that it was a, a Lawrence because the ancestors had the original drawing, yes. which he was trying to trace. Well, that's very interesting. You mention here two of the main British portrait painters of the 18th and 19th century, uh, following on from Gainsborough and Reynolds. And in my opinion, uh, I don't think it's by either of those two artists. Uh, and the reasons I would say, first of all, taking Rumney, um, is that the brushwork is, is quite different in this painting from anything that Rumney ever did. He tended to use rather angular brush strokes um, and uh, this in no way has that sort of brushwork. No. Uh, likewise, Lawrence, who was another very, very great painter, yeah. uh, had very, very flashy brushwork, oh. sort of sparkling. And, uh, uh, and this picture, uh, in my opinion, again, uh, is probably most likely by an artist called Sir William Beechey, who is a lesser known artist, mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways perhaps a rather duller painter. Uh, he's a very uh, rather conservative in his brushwork yes. and uh, this picture I think um, if you look at the details of it you can see the way the hands are painted and it's it's perfectly competent but it doesn't perhaps have the um, the extra bit that uh, artists like Rumney and Lawrence had mm -hmm. um, it's really in my opinion very typical of his work and I would think in terms of date we're looking at something executed probably at the turn of the century, around 1800, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, it is really a very, very nice painting. Um, I noticed one thing that perhaps bothers me a little bit on first inspection, and that is that this hand sticking out of here um, perhaps doesn't quite work. Um, it, it's, it's rather sort of curious the way it sort of peeps through there, but I don't think he's fully understood it. But other details, such as the face here yes. and here, are, are really very nicely painted. Have you ever had any idea what it, what it might be worth? Well, uh, I can't remember the last valuation, but at the 
time of my grandmother's death, which was before the last war, I, I think none of her pictures were valued at more than five pounds. Yes, but well, since then, I've, yes. I have no idea. Well, you, I think it's gone up a little bit no, we since have. then. Um, I would think that a picture like this, um, fully accepted uh, as by Sir William Beachy, is probably going to be worth somewhere in the region of sort of 15, maybe as much as 20,000 pounds. Which is that? Um, well, it's in very nice condition, which yeah. of course is very important, but also it's a very nice subject of two good-looking people. This is very yes. important. This is a very unexpected find for Hexham. Is it something you've had for some time? Yes, I've had it quite a few years. Um, it's been put away with its face to the wall because it wasn't a picture that we had a great deal of affection for, but nevertheless felt it might be of interest. Yeah, so you, you turned it round and turned brought it, round, it out and brought it down the this show. afternoon. Yes. Well, I, I'm very glad you did. It's uh, absolutely fascinating. It's down here you can see the signature, Hofer. Now, this is uh, Karl Hofer, who was a German painter. Uh, actually dated 18, down here, 1918. Hofer was, uh, as I say, a German, but really his training was entirely French and Parisian. He was in Paris, I think, from uh, 1908 onwards and was very much, first of all, influenced by Cezanne. As you can see, I think, a little bit by the whole technique uh, in this picture, the approach to the um, different um, shapes and the investigations of the, 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 the different angles, the, that, that is the Cézanne-esque element. And of course also the cubism of Picasso and Braque. He's very definitely uh, taken on board a bit here. But the interesting thing about Hofer was that uh, being a German, in 1914 when war broke out, he was not very popular in Paris and was actually thrown into a sort of detention camp really? for most of the war and only re-emerged back in Berlin in 1918, I think I'm right in saying, when he painted this picture. So memories of France are still very strong in him. But uh, I, mean, I, I like, I find it very exciting, his, his very bold use of paint here. It's very thick. Put on with a knife? That's right. Put on with a palette knife. Very little if at all, put on with a brush, or put on this, this, in this very thick, sort of creamy way with a palette knife. And as a result, what you have got here, through a certain, perhaps, lack of attention to the picture, to say it has suffered somewhat you've got a lot of cracking away. in the paint. But I don't think that it's actually in any way um, uh, not remediable. I think that it's perfectly possible if it was well relined, this picture, to, to put it back put it into. Back in pretty good order. And, uh, well, I presumably, as a picture that was standing face into the wall, it was not something you had insured, separately. Absolutely right. Well, I think you certainly should get it insured. I mean, probably for something in the region of 15 or 20,000 pounds. Heavens. So, <laughs> I think also you might turn it round face outwards. Too. Do you know who all these people are? Yes, this is my great-great-grandfather and his family. Uh, this was painted about 1820. Um, they lived in Leith, just outside Edinburgh. It's, it's a really amazing picture. I think it's so nice, very intimate. But it is nice, and uh, we're very fond of it, but the trouble is we've no idea who the artist was. Ah, oh, well, there. I might be able to help you because it was exhibited in the Scottish National Gallery in, in 19... 1956. Yes. At which point they attributed it to um, the son of a, a very well known miniaturist. Yes. Uh, the son's name being Charles Robertson. It does seem to fit. The date is exactly right. Yes. Well, uh, within a year of what yes, you suggested. Yes. And uh, also, the idea of it being by a miniaturist explains quite a few things about this picture that. Uh, that, that intrigue you otherwise. Yes. For example, there's a sort of clumsiness in the perspective um, and the yes. technical merit of the picture yes. that makes you think not, that not the, the artist wasn't used to painting such big pictures. There is a school of thought that he painted one head and put it on all the, oh, the yeah. bodies. I, th uh, I think he would have had to stay with your family for quite some while before he'd finished this picture. Mm. It would have taken him, I feel, months. It's got that kind yes. of meticulous attention to detail as well Possibly, that a yes. miniaturist painter might yeah. use. Mm -hmm. And one of our experts has identified this toast rack yes. as the uh, Robert and Cadman patent expanding toast rack, oh, patented in 1807. <laughs> Such is the detail that he can tell that. Yeah. 
all these figures are really well arranged. You've yeah. got this, this lovely kind of compositional circle going on yeah. of glances and looks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole thing finished off by the father who's got a look of slight dismay on his face, and I think I'm it's... I'm not I th yeah, I, but <laughs> Not as much as her look of dismay. Well, I think that's uh, a look of resignation, isn't it? Yes, it has uh, to be. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he's, I think he's actually looking across to uh, one of his sons here, yes. and he's saying, don't you bring that dead duck in here. He's dripping blood all over the carpet. <laughs> but what I really like about this picture is the... Um, is the faces of each of the children. I think their yeah. characters are all immediately identifiable. On the whole, a, a ravishing picture, a real cross-section of life as it must have been. But artistically not... Well, I, well, it doesn't worry me. I mean, uh, I like it, yes. Technically, technically perhaps it falls yes. down in some ways, but yes. it's so charming, it transcends all of that, I yes. think. Yes. And um, to put a value on the picture, well, now that is difficult because, of course, um, the artist doesn't have really a a good track record in the marketplace, although we don't really mind who it's by, yeah. it's such a wonderful slice of life mm -hmm. that it's got to command £15,000. Mm -hmm. I think it could even go up to £20,000 and perhaps more. Goodness. But I wouldn't replace it. You couldn't replace it. Well, I couldn't, couldn't replace, replace it, no. Replace it uh... it. It's the most wonderful picture. This is part of a collection of watercolours and drawings uh, by Frederick Cecil Jones, who was a Yorkshire artist. On the easel here, we have um, a view of Beverley and of Pudsey. And here we have um, an industrial landscape, or partly industrial landscape, of a town which we think is probably Halifax. We're not absolutely certain. Other of the drawings, other of the drawings are inscribed. Uh, what I like particularly about this one is the attention to detail. And also here is the rural landscape with the farmer ploughing his field and then the kind of urban spread and the train racing by under a viaduct. Yes. Now can you tell me a little bit about how you came to uh, have the collection? Yes, well my husband bought them. We've always liked collecting paintings, but my husband bought the collection about 20 years ago from an auction. I think actually my favourite, and I believe your favourite too is yes, this that's right. wonderful view of Skipton. Yes, it's beautiful. After a shower, and I think is uh, quite remarkable. Yes. Um, he was he taught in was born in Bradford and taught in Bradford, and also he was a printmaker. And I think you can see there from some of the technique in his drawings yes, this right. pen work here, and yes. fine cross hatching, and um, lovely bits of local detail. And also you can see the walkers and various yes. holiday makers amongst the mm -hmm. normal townspeople going about their business. Now, I think we've counted up and there's something like 40 in all. Yes, we have about 40. Yes. Yeah. Did, you, did you know how much um, was paid for them when you... Um, I think you paid about £20. For the whole lot? For the collection. And have you any idea what you think they might be worth? Oh, I'm afraid not. It's either. difficult, but I think probably together they would be worth something like fifteen to £20,000 for the lot. Now? Yes. Now? Yes. Oh. <laughs> You're somewhat surprised, aren't well, you? Well, yes, I mean, we've just had them 20 years and that's just fantastic. I mean, yes, we yes. just love them, you know, it's just become part of the family, really. Ralph Headley is a local artist of quite some repute and I'm not surprised to see it here, but I am delighted to see such a magnificent work. Tell me about your connection with this picture. Well, I'm Ralph Headley's great-grandson. Um, uh, I didn't inherit it, I bought it. Uh, for about £50 in 1971. Of course, he is well known for his working class yes. subjects, as it were. Yes. And here is a scene that you would have seen all over Britain. Yes. Because they made bricks on the spot in all sorts of places. But I can't think of many paintings of brickmaking. Yes. Do you know about brickmaking? Well, I do because I have, <laughs> because I have this painting. Really have the painting. It tells me about brickmaking. Well, it does really, doesn't it? Yes. And I'll tell you why I like this picture immensely because the composition tells the story. Yes. It's all about composition. Where do you start? In a way, well, of course, you start, in most pictures, in the foreground. And where does it lead your eye? It leads your eye down here to this anonymous heap. What is that heap? Of course, that is the clay. clay. And that clay has actually been sitting there probably for a year. And then it leads you back down the um, wheelbarrow track uh, and where does the clay go? It goes into this machine. So as you say, I haven't done a quick course in brickmaking as well yes. with this picture. <laughs> and 
Then they fill up the bricks, and it seems to me that they squeeze out the water and it comes down this channel. And then she's placing the bricks here. That's what good composition about. It leads your eye around the picture. And there is no question that this composition is a very dynamic composition. Not just because your eye is led around the picture, but when you come to this figure, in the foreground, the main figure of the girl placing the bricks from the moulds just to dry out in, on, on the earth, she is echoed by the man with the wheelbarrow. So then you're, you see the dynamics of the two working people, each with a different task. Now, uh, the interesting thing is, was that in the family? This, this is the sketch for the painting. No, a, a London gallery inquired about this picture yeah. of the Laying Art Gallery in Newcastle. Right. And they... Uh, led directly to Led directly to me, yeah. and um, I couldn't refuse to buy it. No. Well, I think it's very interesting, because this is... Here is the artist working out his thoughts in a sketch. Yes. And it, it doesn't really work. And we can see here that instead of having a dynamic here, it's rather flat and one plane. And the wall doesn't lead to the clay, and he hasn't got it right. He's working out his thoughts. It's very interesting you should bring the two, because this is what art is all about. Value. What did you say it cost you? I can't remember. £50. £50. 1971. 1971, yeah. Not bad. I think a fair value is £35,000, £40,000. would. I was sitting at the Dome right across the street from here, and uh, I saw the queue and uh, knew about that it was happening there. And uh, when the queue eased up, Franz said, uh, my wife said, uh, why don't we, uh, why don't we have them look at that painting of ours that we have hanging yes. in the house? And I said, good idea, and I left the coffee there, and I went down to the house. I live right around the corner here, and uh, brought it up here. Now look at me, star time. Well, thank heavens you did. Thank heavens you did, because uh, what you've brought in is one of the most interesting and important things that I think I've seen ever on the show. Really? Down in the corner here, we've got the signature here, T. Fujita, and here we have the most important Japanese painter in a Western style of this century. Wow. How did he... Glad I he... had that cup of coffee. <laughs> so it's not still getting cold. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, tell me, how, how did you come to have it in your... My wife's uh, father uh, was in the rag trade and he used to go to Paris for the shows. From to... New York. Yeah, from New York, yes. And he used to go to Paris for the fashion shows twice a year and he always come back with a painting or something, some kind of uh, memento of the, uh, of the visit. And he brought that back in the 20s. And my wife remembered it, well, when she was five years old, it was hanging in there. That's really there. interesting that it should be the 20s, because I think I'm writing saying that Fujita first came to Paris just after the First World War. I mean, well, just really, literally that... at that time. He was a real pioneer. Uh, he was the first Japanese to move into this sort of very avant-garde painting circles, I mean, the, the Ecole de Paris, he was a friend of Modigliani, for instance. Oh. And you can see, I think, in this picture, the obvious Modigliani echoes. Uh, well, I the know faces. who Modigliani is, yeah. but I've never heard of him. <laughs> you can see the resemblance, anyway. And you can also perhaps see even a little bit of influence of Matisse in the uh, very bold setting of the figures against a sort of matte background in this way. And uh, that, that was Fujita painting in amongst the really big boys in the 1920s. Oh, that's good news. This actually is painted in a, well, pen and ink drawing, plus a bit of uh, body color. And uh, it's very, very fine. Do I have to worry about insurance on it? Well, I think, uh, tell me, have you got it insured at the moment? No. I mean, have you got it sort of on, well, on just part of your on, general on a policy? On a general policy. General policy, yeah. Well, I suppose, okay. I suppose. <laughs> How can I put it? Um, I think you should probably insure it for fifty thousand pounds. <laughs> when I come for a roadshow, I think it's particularly dangerous to try and anticipate what one might find. And I suppose coming to Eldham and this particular part of uh, the country, one must think, well, possibly a work by Ellis Lowry might turn up. But I must say, when this popped out, I mean, I couldn't have been more surprised and delighted. Because as far as I'm concerned, 
it's absolutely right. Having said that, of course, we must go to the museum, the Lowry Museum, and have it checked out. But all my instincts and the way that it looks makes me feel that it's absolutely spot on and beautiful. What's the story? I brought it in for a friend of mine, an gen elderly gentleman, about 79 years of age. They did belong to his wife, who's passed away. She used to chauffeur Lowry. He was very fond of having people chauffeuring about all over the country. And uh, this is how they came into his possession. Yes. To all intents and purposes, Lowry's style, these um, industrial buildings, yeah, yeah. the figures, the busy yeah. streets, Little are dogs. all rather similar. But I think from this particular period, and if I haven't been mistaken, the date is 1937, a good early period. Um, I just love the colour and the busyness of the streets. And for my own taste, it is not too melancholic, it's not too brooding. It has a, yeah. a busyness and kind of optimistic air, which sometimes is not always apparent in his paintings. Thick paint, we call it impasto. You can see here that he's drawn right through the thickness of paint across these bits here. I particularly love that passage here, these figures in the distance so they're pushed in and just touched with colour. And also one of the things about it is one can judge it quite carefully because when they haven't been protected by glass, they get full of grime and dirt. And this has got glass on it and yeah. it's kept the dirt off it. You can see right the way through and just oh, a little yes. bit of a gentle clean yeah. will bring it up into an absolute gem. Now, yeah. before we turn to values, let's also look at these other things. Tell me about this little drawing here. <laughs> this is a cigarette packet. Right. And you can see that because here yes. are the folds of it here yes. going across there. Yes. 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 When this lady was chauffeuring Laura, he was sat in the car and he started to sketch this. And then when he finished, he was about to throw it through the window. And she said, don't do that. And he said, well, I'll sign it for you if you want it. It might be of some value someday. Really? What a lovely story. Yeah. So do you think he really was going to throw it out the window? Yeah. He, yes. he, he didn't realise his value of his no, paintings no, then. No, no, no. And we've got a photograph here of the great yeah. man himself. Yeah. And what is so interesting is that, of course, if you could just hold that a second, of course, it shows the subject this is a painting, and this is a drawing for this painting, but it's That's the same right, subject, yeah. which is a ferry, isn't it, yeah. in Scotland, isn't it? Yes, the Scottish it subject. Is, yeah. Yes. And again, this is the later date, September 1958. Now, of course, what we must do is kind of try and work out the value. Now, my word of caution is the attributions must be confirmed by the Lowry Museum. Um, but these little bits and pieces, the cigarette packet, I don't know whether it's worth thousand or more but it could well be this drawing number of thousand pounds but I think what we're really all dying to kind of really try and know is what's this worth does your friend have any idea of what he thinks it's worth no no he's probably he's a shy man is he oh yes very shy. well <laughs> I think it's probably worth a hundred thousand pounds oh, gosh <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, it now becomes a horrible problem, doesn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. If I was being conservative, I suppose 60 to 80, but I think it is so fresh, so wonderful, has not been on the market. The prices have been quite extraordinary, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it could fetch £100,000 or more. It's never been up the wall. 